Hello, everybody. Tilting it back. How's that? A little lower. Here we go. <laughs> hey, what do you guys think of this title? Are you into the pun? Your feedback is irrelevant. <laughs> I've got a trunk full of them, and I'm very happy to get to share them with you today. But honestly, what we're here to talk about is this guy right here, whose name is on the screen for you to read. <laughs> You're welcome, Kirk. <laughs> I'm gonna stick with his nickname, which is Bin Al Jazari. That's the town he's from, the place where he was born, which is in modern day Turkey, on the eastern edge near the Middle East. And he was born in 1136. So this guy who we're talking about here is fucking incredible. I'm just gonna get straight to the point here. <laughs> uh, he was a polymath, an engineer, a scientist, a scholar, an artist, an inventor. And he created this book called uh, The Book of Knowledge of incredible mechanical devices. So notice I didn't credit him with humble, but <laughs> who needs to be humble when you come up with all this cool shit? <laughs> he is uh, credited for inducing, introducing many things to the world, segmented gears, camshafts, crankshafts, hydraulic powered motors, suction pumps, laminated timber so it doesn't warp, early robotics. So, um, a little to the side. Yeah, definitely. Um, even if you don't really care about uh, modern motors or the upcoming robotic apocalypse, you can still give him <laughs> some credit for building the foundation for these things. And many circles he's credited to being the father of modern day engineering. It's impossible to overemphasize the importance that he added to this field. So honestly, I think he should have had a Ninja Turtle named after him. <laughs> da Vinci Leonardo stole, or at least was inspired by Al Jazari. So I'm waiting for that edit in the storyline. Uh, but even though he it was so accomplished and he came up with all these important things, the thing he's most well known for is his elephant clock, the subject of our talk today. And I'm here to basically to tell you that that is totally reasonable because it is amazing. <laughs> so here's where we get into the Rube Goldberg elements of this story. Uh, the way that it works is that um, clocks back in the day in 1206 when he created this design didn't have uh, pendulums or quartz or atomic methods to power them, so he was using a water clock method. Basically, he, he created this bowl of water, and inside was a bucket, and that bucket had a very carefully calibrated hole in the middle that would fill the bucket over the course of precisely 30 minutes. Once 30 minutes were done, the bucket would sink, it would pull on a line, <laughs> That line would create a flute sound. That flute sound would um, cause a bird to spit around on the top. <laughs> also, at the same time, there would be a scribe who would tilt precisely seven degrees around, and a circle would get half shaded to represent that 30 minutes of the day had been taken up. Also, a ball is released from a mechanism at the top of a tower. It rolls around. It goes into a falcon mouth. The ball drops from the falcon mouth into a serpent, which drops down. I think I've gotten behind myself in the images. You guys are following along, though, right? <laughs> the ball's weight causes the serpent to dip down. It drops into a vase. The vase is made of metal, so it makes a gong sound to let everybody know what's going on. Also, at the same time, there's a writer at the top who um, moves either one arm or the other, so you know whether it's a half hour or a full hour. Thank you, Kirk. <laughs> You're doing great. <laughs> We're not done yet, though. Because <laughs> there's also a Mahout, who's the elephant driver. He's sitting right behind the elephant's ears, and he bangs a drum. And that's when you know that a 30 minutes have passed. <laughs> 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 
So because the serpent no longer has a weight in it, it's going to zip up, and that zipping is going to pull the bucket out of the water so that it can start slowly filling again, and it can continue to mark the hours. And this machine will continue to power itself for as long as there are balls in the tower, and it was built to record 15 hours of daylight, which was the amount that you would have during the solstice at the latitude that Al Jazeera was creating this device because he was amazing. <laughs> but all of this was for a very important purpose, to mark the hours so that if you were Muslim, you could pray at the right time. Uh, and that was really important. That was written down in the Quran. It basically meant that Al Jazz was the equivalent of Steph Curry or Clay Thompson of his day because this was so central to the way that people lived their lives in the place that he was living and working. So um, he got a lot of credit for the work that he did. The king supported him. He had a salary, full salary plus pension so he could spend all of his waking hours studying, researching, writing, and inventing things like this. But what makes it extra exciting is that he was doing this in 1206 when not a lot else was going on in the world <laughs> besides war. So to 1206, we had the Fourth Crusade. We had skirmishes between the Dutch and the Germans. We had the fall of Constantinople the year before. Now it's Istanbul. We all know that. <laughs> Uh, also, uh, if you've heard of the Mongol invasion, that was happening too. <laughs> Here in North America, we were doing just fucking fine because we hadn't been discovered yet. Uh, and in Europe, <laughs> they were in the midst of the Middle Ages and still thought the sun that went around the earth. So Al Jazz was definitely in a key place in this period of time in the Islamic Empire, which stretched from Morocco all the way to Pakistan and was in a golden age. Uh, there were a bunch of things that Al Jazz did all by himself that really made him the genius and inventor that he was. He totally deserves all the credit, but I'm also here to tell you that he didn't do it by himself. He certainly built this clock on the back of geniuses. And um, those geniuses were around in the Islamic Empire because of something called the House of Wisdom. I know. We can give that one some science props, right? <laughs> Uh, a lot of people think that Wikipedia started in 2001, but I am here to tell you <laughs> that its spiritual beginnings were um, going all the way back to the early 800s when Caliph uh, Harud al-Rashan, I'm sorry, Kurt, that one's not written down. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he collected all these scholars and translators from all across the world, brought them to one place, and said, I want all of the wisdom of the world in this one building. Go. <laughs> so these uh, translators were working really hard throughout this age of wisdom to translate things from ancient Rome, ancient Greece, um, let's see, Persia, India, China, Egypt, and create it all in a language that people in the Islamic empire could read. So um, that includes Al Jazz, our guy. Uh, also, they were supporting the collective um, enterprise of learning. So there was a lot of money and encouragement that went into this. It was kind of like a period of the reverse inquisition because they were punishing religious leaders who were speaking against this collection of knowledge. And uh, <laughs> that was kind of unheard of. Um, so there were huge developments. Uh, some say the creator of the modern scientific method came out of this school of thought. There were huge developments in optics. Physics, technology is definitely something we should start reading about, but there's more of that <laughs> because Al Jazz, our guy, also was living near Baghdad, which was a node on the Silk Road. So not only did he have access to all this historic knowledge, he also had access to up-to-date knowledge from the East and the West, um, places like China, Egypt, and Moorish Spain. It was all coming at him from every different direction. And so we have a guy who has all of this information available to him and is a creative innovator himself. 
So he pulls from what he knows. For example, he knows that uh, Egypt invented this idea of the water clock. They were the ones who divided the day into 24 hours. They created obelisks that they used to mark the time by the sun. And they uh, made this, this water clock device that worked kind of like an hour device, um, hourglass. And we know that he knew the origins of this technology because he put an Egyptian phoenix on the top of his clock just to say, hey oh, what's up Egypt? <laughs> I got you. But he wasn't only pulling from Egypt because um, technology innovates, and so Greece had taken these ideas from Egypt and bettered them. In fact, Plato even came up with his own water clock that worked like an alarm, so it could like let you know when a certain amount of time had passed, and he wanted to do this because his students kept sleeping in, didn't show up for class. I don't have time to tell you about Plato's ideas about alarm clocks <laughs> or the Japanese idea of aroma clocks, but find me after. I will wax nostalgic. There's a lot of cool stuff about this. Um, let it be known, Egypt was an important part of the evolution of this, but along comes India, and they come up with this idea of creating systems like the one that Al Jaz used, um, going all the way back to 2800 BCE. And um, there is a Buddhist text about a university in India that used a bowl that had a hole in the bottom that sank and then started a drum that sounds remarkably similar to what Al Jazeera was using in his elephant clock. And we know that he pulled it from that because he put his clock in an Indian elephant to say, hey oh, what's up India? <laughs> but there's another hidden what's up in this clock because um, there's this guy named Susong, S-U, <laughs> S-O-N-G, <laughs> look him up. <laughs> Because back in 907, he established modern horology. That's the science of timekeeping. Yes. Uh, this is a full 300 years before Al Jazri comes along. He creates the most sophisticated mechanical clock that's ever been seen. And Al Jaz knows about this clock because, hey, what's up? There's a Chinese dragon on the clock. Also, he wants to give a solid salute to all of his fellow uh, members of the Arabic Empire, so he puts all the rest of the mechanical figures in turbans to say, we know what's going on. And all of these um, influences helped him to become the man that he is. And so I just want to pause for a second and point out that there are a lot of innovators in our history who borrowed from their forefathers, uh, like Steve Jobs, Al Einstein, Sir Isaac Newton, Tom Edison. Uh, in my mind, I just want to give some props to my favorite genius, Beyonce. <laughs> Uh, and they didn't create what they knew out of nothing. They all had influences near and far that helped them on their path, but they didn't all <laughs> say what's up like Al Jazz did. He had the courage to give credit to his forefathers and to acknowledge that innovation, it isn't a singular task. And um, if we look at this clock, it's basically giving physical form to all the thank you notes that Al Jazeera couldn't send out. It, um, in a way, it exemplifies multiculturalism. All of the crashing and convergence of knowledge that was happening across civilizations in this one point in a single object, a curiosity. And if that doesn't make you curious to look at the world in a new way, to see every invention as something that has a fully formed story just without all the thank you notes that Al Jay's Jazz gave us, I have no idea what will. Um, I'm going <laughs> to encourage you to see the origin story of this simple toaster <laughs> as something really inspiring that can spark this cre these creative juices in you. I'm like currently double dog daring everybody in this audience <laughs> to engage in, um, in tracing the story back. But I don't want to end on that note because I feel like there might be some souls in this room who are like, hey, oh, wait a second. What if this is some Rube Goldberg ruse of like a fantasy clock that an engineer in 1206 made but wasn't able to actually create in his lifetime? He just wrote it down in a book of incredible knowledge. I am here to say that that, 
you can put that aside. Because <laughs> I corresponded with somebody who made one. <laughs> this thing exists. You can go visit it. Harvey can go visit it. <laughs> uh, Ahmed, the guy I talked to, works with 1001 Inventions, which is really trying to push forward the idea that we had a lot of innovators that didn't come from white people land. <laughs> and uh, so they had a team of, oh god, designers and artists and sculptors and architects and draftsmen, and they all came together, spent six months on this object, 11,000 man hours, and all of it came from the one document, that book of knowledge of ingenious mechanical devices that Al Jazri wrote that our San Francisco library has a copy of, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> and um, based on the experience, they said definitively there's no chance that this was a fantasy. He had to have built it because there's no way he could put so many details in the design without having had his hands on this object. Um, the, the, the craftsmen who created this were really thorough about being, um, being dedicated to Al Jazri's vision, to trying to make it as accurate as possible. They knew he was using an Indian elephant, so they used photographs from Indian elephants to carve this very accurate elephant. And as soon as they put it on display, haters started showing up and being like, hey, what's with this elephant? <laughs> it's totally wrong. <laughs> Uh, saying things like, it should be bigger, or its tusk should be longer, or its tusk should be shorter, or it should have different lumps on behind its ears. And this sculptor from South Africa's reaction to all of this was, it's good to hear that so many people know so much about elephants. <laughs> Which is so adorable. <laughs> My reaction is a little bit different. I say, fuck yeah. <laughs> Those people are probably curious about their toasters, too. <laughs> so um, I would like to raise a glass. This one is a catch-all. To people who care about ordinary objects, to inventions from non-white people land, from folks like Anetta digging history out of deep storage and wanting to tell stories about it, and for your future, being a curious soul who says, no, I don't think that's right, too. So here's to you. <laughs> so uh, what I heard there was the instruction manual for that clock is available. <laughs> at the San Francisco Library, so there is nothing stopping you. It's already been done. <laughs> Can totally get to work on that. I would like to see that. I would like to see that contraption. I believe, I believe, and Casey can correct me, but I believe there are two built versions of that elephant clock now. There's one in a mall in Dubai somewhere. And then there is the one that was, that, that, that she spoke about being recreated that um, was at the Science Museum London, and I'm not sure where it is now, but they have, they have stuff on the Science Museum London website about it. All right, before I close down for tonight, um, so in this project, one of the things that our speakers do so well, so often, is talk about something that when we do our brainstormings, at the time, about 30 days out before we do a salon, they know nothing about. Tonight, all six of our speakers took on stories that 30 days ago they knew nothing about. And to me, I wanted to do that tonight to start our fifth year because to me that really strikes at the core of what we're doing of encouraging everyone to dig into the joys of research and finding out these wonderful stories. And I want to give a special thank you to all of tonight's speakers for taking on the curatorial challenges this evening. That was a special, special treat for me, you guys. Thank you so much. That came together beautifully. I did. I tricked you all. Ha. Um, 
coming up next, um, we're going to be back here in two weeks on the 20th. Uh, join us for stories of taboos. We're going to be examining prohibited aspects of culture from the sacred invi inviolable to the uncomfortably profane. We're going to learn about what the Tongans forbade of Captain James Cook, how to punish the unforgivable with uh, damnatio more, memore, what it was that what was criminal research in Soviet science? Why pork is deliciously sacrilegious? That's a question I have had a lot of questions about. Um, how we avoid discussing death and how Victorian ladies apparently never pooped. Uh, that's coming up at Taboo on February 20th. It's curated by Isolde Anore. It's featuring Leonard Appleton, Michelle Larson, Barbara North, Skylar Earl, Lightning Leist, and Tamar Baskin, sorry, Beth. <laughs> there are advanced tickets available at the merch booth for, for Taboo coming up. And we are also, um, we have opened our curation, I believe Trey uh, Balshevsky is taking uh, curation suggestions for Impossible now. That is the one that we're open on. But if you're interested in finding out more about our upcoming salons um, and how you can get involved, join us in our discussion group on Facebook. It's called Something Weird. That's also where we ask our speakers to post their follow-ups with reading materials and videos and all of those kinds of things. So you can join us there. And if you have really interesting stories from the, area, the category of curiosity, which is an obviously big one, we welcome you to throw your stories in there, share interesting links and your favorite cabinets of curiosity. We would love to see them. And I would like to thank Beth and Kurt for their wonderful <laughs> job tonight. It seems very complicated. <laughs> and I, 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 we will put the names on the slides <laughs> from now on. Um, once again, thank you, Public Works. Thank you to all of tonight's speakers. Thank you to our volunteers who make this go uh, this evening. And thank you all for coming. Good night. See you in a couple of weeks. I would also like to know who left me this passage on Athanasius Kircher's magnetic clock. <laughs>